Thank you. Uh, Mark, you're exactly right. And I was so glad that you brought up unions and the important role that they play. Because, you know, when I talked earlier about the fact that for 30, 40 years we had an economy that was working well, that saw productivity gains, but also wage gains in roughly equal proportion. And then suddenly the last 30 years you've seen that change. You've seen the productivity gains continue, but you've seen wage growth at practically zero. Well, it's not a coincidence that for three, four decades, you had strong unions from the mid-1940s until about the late 70s or so. They were there fighting for workers, fighting for increased wages, fighting for a secure retirement, fighting for real health benefits. Then you saw in the economy beginning in the early 1980s, the power of unions decline. The number of workers involved in the workforce who were unionized declined. And I don't think it's a coincidence that just as you saw the number of workers in unions decline and the number of unions decline and the power of unions decline, you also saw real wages decline. Certainly no coincidence. For 70 years, worker wages and the strength of unions have moved in tandem, going up together or going down together. Critical to the strength of the American workforce are provisions like Davis-Bacon that have existed since the late 1940s that guarantee a prevailing wage on federal projects. And you know, it helps not just those workers who are unionized, it lifts all workers. Because when you have a union that's out there fighting for higher wages and fighting for better benefits for its members, it helps all workers. It helps all of those in the workforce. But, you know, I, I talked earlier and I was thinking about this when, when Mark was talking about his family's experience in those towns in the, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I remember from my own family's experience, uh, we were very lucky that my dad with, uh, without a college education, with the equivalent of a high school education, was able to get, uh, after many years of, of trying, was able to break into uh, Teamsters Local 169 uh, as a warehouseman. Simply means he worked in a, a warehouse for Acme Markets. Did that for 25 years. There were a couple thousand such workers who were employed in the city of Philadelphia. And then in the late 90s, around the year 2000, they closed all those warehouses, laid off close to 2,000 workers, and decided that they would set up shop instead in a place where they could pay the workers half the wages, reduce benefits, and not as many workers. Fortunately, things worked okay for my dad. He ended up on his feet, uh, spent the last 16 years as a worker, as a janitor. Uh, for SEPTA, our cities, and uh, our Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. But many of the guys who got laid off in their 50s and 60s weren't as lucky. Many of them never found, again, a job as well-paying or as secure. Some turned to alcohol. Some turned to drugs. A couple even committed suicide. So again, I want to show that these are not just economic issues. Sometimes the elites, and I mean elites not just on the Republican side, elites of all political ideologies, sometimes look at these as just economic issues. They are real life issues. When we see the diseases of hopelessness that are happening right now in places like Western Pennsylvania or Texas or Kentucky, or really all parts of our country. And by the way, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, what we are talking about touches all races, all ethnicities, all backgrounds. These diseases of hopelessness that have been on the dramatic rise are a real problem for our society. But to look at them as just a drug problem, or just an alcohol problem, or just a mental health problem, and not see the economic link is very naive and incomplete and will never solve uh, the real problem. Go to the heart of solving the real problem. So Mr. Speaker, I, I look forward with Mark and I, we both look forward, and I know this is something, Mark, that, that you've mentioned to me 
We look forward periodically coming to this House floor and talking about this new president's record when it comes to addressing these issues. You know, he talked a lot during the campaign, made a lot of promises. He is great at making promises. In fact, he would probably say he's the best ever at making promises. Well, we're going to be showing his record to see if he is keeping those promises to the American people. On some issues, he sounded like a Democrat. On some issues, when it came to infrastructure or trade, he said things that I can agree with and do agree with. Now that he's president, let's see if the record matches the rhetoric. So we're going to be here to hold him accountable, to hold both sides accountable. Because, you know, the fact is, this town for many decades has not looked out for the blue-collar worker. We are quick to indict the other side where they are wrong, and I think appropriately so. Uh, but this blue-collar caucus is for all those who really want to make a difference in the blue-collar economy, for those who want to put the American worker first and foremost. I can say President Trump is not off to a great start with some of his cabinet picks, who look more like the board at Goldman Sachs than any union hall. I hope that this first month uh, will not be a sign of more to come. But whether he's getting an A or an F, we're going to be here to grade his performance on these real-life meat and potato issues that matter to the vast, American, vast majority of American families. Mark, I, I wanted to ask you, though, since uh, we represent two different regions of the country, two different areas, yet in many ways exactly the same kind of folks. I wanted to know what you're hearing as you go out into your community in Fort Worth about how things are going for American workers and what they want from this administration.